All right, and just so everybody is aware, we are recording this meeting. All right, well, thank you all for joining me on this morning. Uh, my name is Eric Rodden. I am senior planner here at Dr. Cog, working on coordinating our Crash Data Consortium. Um, see a lot of folks in the room here who have been with us from the start, which is great, and a lot of new names as well. So welcome to all, thank you for joining us. I'm gonna move us right along into our uh, agenda for the day. Um, I'm gonna do a brief recap on our timeline for where we started at this project and where we're what we're looking at doing over the next several months. Um, then we're gonna get an update on some crash data processing from our colleagues at the Department of Transportation. Uh, we'll get a tour of the inventory indicators dashboard from our colleague at the Department of Public Health and Environments. Um, my colleague here, Dr. Cog, Byron Schultz will be giving a um, walkthrough of the 2021 crash data product that we have, some updates that we have on our end, and an introduction to a project we are kicking off. And then finally, I will wrap us up with going over some updates to the needs assessments um, based on comments that we received at our last meeting and on the draft documents. Um, I went through all of the comments that we received and all of the notes and transcripts we got from the workshops. And I'm really excited to share what we have um, consolidated with that and how that's come together. So again, a brief look at the timeline. So at this point, we are about a year and almost a year and a half into this project. Um, we have had three meetings, a kickoff last November, a uh, meeting in May where we were joined by the Department of Transportation and Department of Revenue and a meeting last fall where we went over the draft inventory and needs assessments and reached out for all of your um, commentary. In this time, we did a number, a couple of surveys. We did a lot of conversations with many of you and to learn about how we use crash data, what you use it for, the sources, um, what's working well, what is a challenge with it. And we did create these documents. They are currently, Still in processing. Um, I'm planning, I'm hope, hoping to get those out to you all in the next couple of weeks. Um, they're finalized as far as the content goes, but we are just being really um, keen to be aware of accessibility concerns. And we want to make sure that when we distribute these, they're good to go. And so they are, our, my colleagues here in our communications and marketing have done a really great job to help me with the writing on it, make it make it stronger, make it clearer, and with the accessibility. And we're excited to get those out to you in the next couple of weeks. Um, today is the 29th, of course, our, our meeting here. And so I'm glad you're all here with us. And as we look forward to the rest of the fiscal year, this we are operating on the federal fiscal year calendar. So through, so that goes from October through September. So as we look towards the next several months, towards the end of this year in September, we're gonna be working on really taking the needs we've come up together and developing and implementing solutions based off of that. Um, our grant was really looking at investigating and demonstrating the value of the crash data consortium, inventory needs of the region and working to solve common issues with crash data collection and, pro and processing. And so with that, we are, I'll, I'll touch on that towards the end, but just to be brief, we'll move on here. Um, we'll probably have another meeting or two of this group. I think they've been really valuable. I, I think that I've learned a lot from them and I hope that all of you have as well. Um, so once we have some dates set for that, we'll be distributing that. We are looking to do a sort of end of year survey as part of the project and wrapping it all up with at least some for this calendar year with a final report on what we've learned. And again, some of these, some of these outcomes, recommendations, and next steps we can do as a region and as a consortium. With that, I'd really like to um, just invite um, our guests to, to begin. Um, we're joined today um, with Alyssa Heron and David Swenka of the Department of Transportation. And I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and let them take control. Cool. Can everybody hear me OK? I'm trying a new headphone situation, which is always pretty risky <laughs> for a meeting. Um, cool. Uh, let's see. Cool. And screen is sharing. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, oops. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Alyssa Heron. I am a traffic safety analyst over at CDOT. Um, I work under my manager, David Swanka, in the traffic programs or safety programs data and analysis unit. 
Um, we're going to do just a quick update today, looking at um, CDOT's crash data, what's available, looking at the dashboard, um, the crash data website updates, and uh, a little bit more about uh, data accessibility, and then some quick updates about uh, BEST. Um, so first up, uh, anybody can request data through the Colorado Open Records Act. Um, on our website, uh, you can just search c.cora um, and it will pop up. You can click on this link here and it'll take you to um, a uh, form where you can submit, uh, in, submit a request for information. Um, it says up there that there may be a fee uh, assessed for a records request, but 99.99% of them do not incur a fee. Um, these are really great for the public, uh, specifically looking for smaller data sets like, um, you know, I want to know how many crashes happen at this particular intersection over the last five years. Um, they're great for people who don't necessarily have the data literacy to work with um, larger data sets. Um, and we uh, we take uh, we take a bunch of these per week. I'd say at least a few dozen a week. Um, so it's definitely something that we're very used to. Um, other than that, we have the crash data available on our website all the way back to 2007. Um, we do have data dictionaries for both of these. And of course, if anybody here has any questions about this data, you are more than welcome to reach out to me about it. Um, I'll have Dave drop in my uh, email address because I actually it's in here at the end, so he doesn't have to worry about it. Um, so these do come in an Excel format. So these do require some type of data literacy to be able to filter down, um, get the specific data that you want. Uh, but for, let's say, a university student who wants to look at Colorado's uh, crash data as a whole, this is a great resource. Um, I use these data sets myself when I, I just want to work with, um, you know, a, a nice clean data set. This is where I go. Um, on the dashboard, which is uh, listed just below, um, each one of these blue tiles goes to a separate page on the um, crash data dashboard. These are great for kind of big picture, um, just kind of generalized data. Like if you want to look at you know, how does this year compare to last year, but you don't need real specific numbers like, um, you know, how many DUIs were charged or something like that. If you just want to know how many crashes there are, um, this is a great resource. And there are uh, separate dashboards for a statewide summary. Um, and then on the right here, you see the occupant table, uh, which is broken down specifically by the occupants of the crashes, whereas a statewide summary um, is uh, the crash as a whole versus the individuals involved. Um, there is also a non-motorist table, which goes into uh, uh, crashes specific to um, pedestrians, bicyclists, and other non-motorized vehicles. Non-motorized forms of transport, I guess, because um, there are low-powered vehicles like golf carts and ATVs, but that's, <laughs> there's always an asterisk on everything, right? Um, for, um, Let's see. So for the crash data website, um, we will be putting in an update uh, soon to include the 2023 data. We're about, I'd say, 80% reported and completed. Um, unfortunately, the 20% that isn't reported and completed are the important ones like uh, your fatalities and things like that. Um, I expect those will be hopefully more or less complete around October. Um, but as reporting officers on this call know, um, the fatalities can take a lot longer and, and those are really um, the meat and potatoes of the crash data. Um, 2022 data is complete. We may make some small updates um, to that as we get uh, feedback from our uh, partners like Dr. Cog and others. Um, we are always happy to take a look at any data work that um, our partners do and then reincorporate that into our data. Um, myself and my team, we are six people or seven people. Um, and so as much as I would love to be able to nitpick every single little thing, um, it just isn't humanly possible for us. Um, so updates like those will be restricted to 2021 data and further um, just because 
2020 was such a weird year between COVID and the switch in the crash form. Um, but also, uh, it just it's in a it's in a completely different format, and it's not worth us updating. Um, we will be adding a newsletter form to the website. Um, it isn't quite up yet, but um, Dave just dropped a link in the chat if you would like to be notified when we get updates. You basically just get this little blurb on the side, um, you know, minor updates to 21 and 22 crash data, but that would also inform you of big updates like when we do post the 23 data. Um, so best phase three, we're working on continued processing improvements. Um, this includes some uh, automatic processing when we receive data from DOR. Um, we're able to, uh, let's say, assign a city based on a reporting agency. Um, but one thing that I've been really working on the past, I'd say, six or seven months is building relationships with uh, the reporting agencies directly to help improve their crash data. And they've all been so incredibly receptive and I am so appreciative of that. Um, and most of the issues stem from the switch from the 2447 to the 3447. Um, and this, a lot of them also pertain to switches and RMSs where uh, the data is being collected, but it's not being transmitted. Um, for example, one reporting agency, instead of having the fields listed as latitude, longitude, they were listed as XY. Um, and the DOR system, the, the, this is getting technical, but the WSDL didn't know what to do with that field because it didn't have a name matching. Um, so it just clicked the data. Um, so there are a few training issues. Um, one reporting agency, and I won't name them, but this, this sergeant just sounded so defeated. He's just like, with all due respect, uh, they won't listen to me. Um, and they certainly won't listen to you. And that was such a bummer because it's just like, I feel like if they felt, if officers felt confident in, in filling out the form, it would be more of a reflex and less of a laborious chore. Um, because these, these, this does end up uh, directly affecting safety decisions and it would be a disservice to their community to not try and get the best data possible. But I understand that the officers are doing a million things. Um, we will be working on an external crash form. We are uh, currently building it, not quite in the phase of testing yet. Um, if you are a reporting agency and you would like to be involved, definitely reach out and let me know. Um, hopefully we can get our data looking less like this where we got all this data missing um, and more into complete um, nice and clean data that's geolocated and ready for our engineers. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. I did run a little bit over. Um, and there's my email if anybody would like to reach out. Uh, but yeah, thank you guys so much for uh, having us. Hey, Lessa, I'll, I'll add a few things to... Uh, and hello, everyone. I'm, I'm David Spike. I'm with CDOT Headquarters, Traffic and Safety. So our group uh, manages crash data for analysis in our safety programs. So, so with the open records request, that is generally for the public. If you're a local agency, if you're a city, county, MPO, you, you could request that crash data directly from us. And a lot of you have been, uh, for instance, we don't make you go through the core process. Most of that's for the lawyers um, and, and, and stuff like that but we don't know what, what, what's happening with that data or how they're going to use it. Uh, and also, if you're, if you're a consultant, if you're working for CDOT, if you're working for a local agency, um, that is also something that could be provided more directly as opposed to a core request. And that's why when, when, we, um, when we get those requests, we do ask that you, you copy your, your project manager or your, your, your uh, primary contact for, for your city, county, your uh, CDOT project manager. So we know that this is for, this is for uh, you know, a, an official project or something like that, where we don't need to go through those, those uh, more formal steps of providing that data. Uh, go ahead, Scott. I'm gonna let you finish. I don't know if you were done yet. If you're not done, then yeah, that that was about it. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I want to talk a bit about um, yeah. I, had, I hadn't heard that you guys were working on developing a different form, but I do want to cover for the the group in the room the first purpose of a crash. Just just so that we're all clear on this, 
uh, the first purpose of a crash in crash reporting, I should say crash reporting, I'm sorry, first purpose of a crash hopefully never happens. Um, but the first purpose of a crash report is to uh, update actions against the motor vehicle record so that the drivers are, are held accountable so that that is actively presented on their MVR, their motor vehicle record. And then the second function of a crash report is where we extend in the data. So I just want to ensure since I hadn't heard that we were working or anybody was working on a different crash report that we're all very clear that crash submissions from law enforcement partners need to go to the Department of Revenue so that they're correctly uploaded to a motor vehicle record. And much of the data that CDOT also gets uh, is through our agreement with CDOT to provide data to them after it's been uploaded to the, the driver's record first. So, um, you know, it sounds like an exciting project coming up, but I want to make sure that we don't advert away from the current practice of ensuring those crash reports reach the DMV first, upload to the motor vehicle record, and then share it out through the agreement with CDOT so that they can scrub that data and then produce dashboards like you guys have done. I think you guys have done a great job trying to show and demonstrate how we use this data within the state to improve traffic safety. Um, but I don't want to get, I don't want to create any confusion there about how that process should be working. So just, just adding that to the, if there's any questions on that, you guys are welcome to ping me or Crystal Soderman, who's also on this call, but we want to make sure that we're still following that process so the crash reports are updated correctly. That's, that's my ad. I'll shut up. Yeah. Thanks, Guy. I appreciate that. Yeah. And, and that kind of details what uh, Alyssa was showing with some of the data elements aren't entirely uniform or complete. And uh, a lot of our efforts are in our group are made to kind of fill in those gaps. So what information we provide is, is, is more useful to uh, most of us here who are looking for that information for reporting or for, for analysis. Uh, to help improve safety across the state, and um, and that's the part that takes time. Actually, the trans, you know, from from crash to submission of the crash to uh, DOR, that's that's been relatively uh, pretty quick uh, of late. You know, some some crashes will take longer than others. Some agencies will take a little bit more time than others, but it's it's usually, you know, as quickly as days to to weeks on on average. But it's the it's the post-processing. That's the part that takes a little bit of time, and we're trying to trim that or find ways of making sure that data gets to uh, the stakeholders in, in as good a shape as possible, but not perfect. Uh, and that's a lot of the efforts that we're working on right now. And we'll take it. We'll take some more questions if there are some. Uh, I do see one in the chat here, David. Um, Ted Hyde asking, will these slides be shared out after the session? Um, I can say that for the Dr. Cog slides, certainly we could provide that. Um, but I don't want to speak for, for you or Ian and Aunt Melissa. So. Yeah, let's, we'll, we'll send you our, our slides so you could distribute it out to the group. Okay. Hey, Alyssa and Dave, I had a question about um, how updates um, might be communicated. I, I just signed up for the newsletter, so thank you for providing providing that. But I'm wondering um, when those notices come in, in terms of maybe data has been updated, how will users be able to know how the data has been manipulated so that they can go into their their data and, and correct those, um, those edits? Is there going to be... Um, at least summary information of like maybe what changed or would it be at the record level? Just curious about how how that feedback is gonna work. Unfortunately, we, and, and this has definitely been a pain point for myself too, there is no way for us to have like a before and after snapshot of the data. Um, so there's no way for us to know what a record looked like when it came into us versus after processing or after, you, you know, you guys return data to us. Um, so there really is no way for us to like, uh, you know, we could say, um, you know, updated GPS data for, you know, whatever region, um, you know, let's say Arapahoe County, but we wouldn't be able to say like records one, two, three, and four, five, six were updated. We like, we wouldn't be able to have that kind of resolution, which is unfortunate. Yeah, I, I agree with the specifics. We wouldn't tell us like, oh, we changed the, the lat long or the location or or the direction. Uh, but each crash record has a date stamp of when it was last updated. 
Um, so there, there is that. There is the when. Um, but those others, yeah, we, we'd have to sort that out on what's the best way to communicate that with uh, the, the elements we have in our database. Okay, I, I think that that's helpful just to have a summary of, of maybe what you know has changed, but also Dave, like you just said, the the date stamp of when it was last edited would be super helpful for data analysts because then it's easy to pull apart that and then just do find and replace for you know for those records. So I think I think that's helpful. Thank you. I guess I could keep going here if no one else has uh, questions. Thanks. Sure. Um, Go for it. <laughs> uh, so then, then a question is um, just related to the timeliness of the data, and more in terms of can we expect a somewhat predictable schedule of when new data sets would be coming out? Alyssa, I know that you mentioned that October would be kind of the time frame for 2023 coming out. Is that something that we can expect like all of every year CDOT would say the data is more or less complete and 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 ready for prime time? I would say that's about the trend. Um, you know, in my gosh, five years of doing this now um, between being a contractor and then uh, being a permanent employee, um, October has been about the time that we get the last of the previous year's fatals and we get, um, we get that kind of data finalized. Um, you know, especially when it comes to toxicology, like we literally have a guy calling coroners, um, to get the data. Uh, that's the kind of legwork we have to do to get these records completed. Um, so I'd say in terms of uh, predicted cadence, um, I'd say October for finalizing um, between mid to late October for finalizing um, the preliminary stuff. Um, we're going to try and get that uploaded. Um, I, I do want to run a couple more checks to kind of see where our data is. Um, but looking at the crash data dashboard, like, Comparing to the previous years in terms of numbers, it looks like we're mostly reported for 2023. Um, you know, electronic data transmission is certainly to thank for that. Um, it's just that the dashboard does show the preliminary data that is um, not necessarily nice and complete. Um, you know, GPSs may not be included in it or, you know, direction fields may be missing. Um, but we certainly want to get some kind of preliminary 23 data because we know we know that's of interest. Um, we're just trying to figure out the best way to pare it down so it gives, you know, the important uh, where, when, and how, but not necessarily like, you know, was this uh, charge DOI because we know that part takes time. Yeah, I, I and I think we'll try to develop some consistent cadence, you know, whether it's like quarterly or, or whatever. Um, and like with the crash data, yeah, I, I agree with Melissa. It doesn't really become final, final until like nine or 10 months after a year, but there is probably a good, I would say an, a potential 95% good set by let's say six months after the year. Um, and granted, there are no technical issues on our side that would, would delay that. But that's sort of a goal that, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to set for the group of getting a, a good complete set out. But in the interim, we'll work on uh, providing a preliminary, preliminary listing that, that should get at least some of the information out earlier. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, anything else? All right, going once, going twice. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> if you think of a burning question at three in the morning, you have my email. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Dave.
Um, I'd like to now turn the meeting over to Ian Danielson from CDPHE. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Ian Danielson. Uh, I am the Injury Epidemiology Supervisor uh, in the Prevention Services Division of CDPHE. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, we work with CDOT um, with some crash data and doing some kind of behavioral analyses with that data, but we also work with um, some injury data uh, that we get from a couple different sources, uh, our vital stats program <clears throat> and our Colorado Hospital Association. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to, we, we have a dashboard that kind of displays this injury data. So I'm just gonna take you on a little stroll through that. So you can see how it might be of use to you or if it, if it might be of use to you. Um, so let me share my screen. Go. Okay, can everyone see that? Sweet. Okay, so here's our landing page for our dashboard. So here we have a choice of where to go. We can either look at deaths or hospital discharges and ED visits. So, um, Deaths come from the Vital Stats program at CDPHE. Hospital discharges and ED visits come from the Colorado Hospital Association. Um, and for each of these, we can look at either counts, so exactly how many injuries happened in a given of a given type in a given area, rates, which essentially are how many injuries uh, per 100,000 people happened, and then age-adjusted rates, which allow you to account for differences in injuries that might be due to different age distributions in an underlying population versus actual differences um, in injury risk. So that would be very important if you were looking at comparing a couple different counties uh, for something like falls. Uh, and because that tends to happen uh, with our older adults more than with our younger adults, that we get fall injuries. So we would want to account for differences in average age in each county if we were trying to make direct comparisons there. So let's look at some let's look at some hospital discharges. I'm going to go to crude rates here, and all this information is contained. Uh, at the bottom of the dashboard, we have, um, you can see here, we have a little question mark that will take you to an informational PDF. You can uh, read a much better, um, much more well-written version of what I'm saying <laughs> if you want to do that on your own time. Um, so here's what the dashboard looks like. Uh, right now we're looking at emergency department visits. Um, I'm going to switch us over to hospital discharges using this little drop down menu here. There we go. So basically, um, a couple things before I walk you through all the toggles we've got here. Um, our unit of analysis here is going to be hospital discharges, not individuals. So this could be one person that was discharged from the hospital multiple times. So keep that in mind if you're trying to interpret this data. Um, also, uh, there are the data sets from emergency department visits to hospitalizations to deaths are mutually exclusive. So if 
a healthcare event is included in one of those data sets, it is not included in the others. So ED visits are people that went to the emergency department and were not admitted to the hospital. And hospitalizations were people that went to the hospital, were admitted and did not die there. Um, deaths are just people who died. Um, so those categories are mutually exclusive, but the categories in our injury drop down here are not. Um, and this is particularly important for motor vehicle. So if I've got motor vehicle injuries, all pedestrians, uh, pedal cyclists, motorcyclists would all be included within this motor vehicle or transport injuries, all category. So these are not mutually exclusive. Um, know that. Also, this data set is, uh, we're kind of using it as is. Uh, the hospital discharges and ED visits data is meant to be communicated to insurance companies for reimbursement. It is not meant for the purposes of uh, surveillance. Uh, we use it for that, um, but that does present certain limitations and that codes can be put in differently. And, um, you know, there are, you know, kind of like, was it a motor vehicle accident? Was it a motorcycle accident? Was the motor vehicle code included with the motorcycle code or was it just the motorcycle code? So, um, you know, those present a couple of difficulties. So take those grains of salt with your data when you're coming to the dashboard. Um, so in terms of using the dashboard, Oh, one more thing. Uh, this is only Colorado residents. So people that were injured or died in Colorado and are Colorado residents, not people who are, for instance, here skiing. They are not included here. Um, so yeah, what we can do here is choose what years we want to include in our data. So right now we're looking at 2016 through 2022, and we can... Um, change that to 2020 to whatever years we want to see. Um, I think, you know, you're going to get better data the more years you include, just because your numbers will, will be larger. Um, we've got distributions by uh, sex assigned at birth. We've got um, age distributions, and we've got trends over time. Um, so we can look at, we have a number of categories, uh, for motor vehicle. I'm going to look at right now, I'm going to go to motorcyclists. Uh, so if we look at motorcyclists, we can look at that and kind of get just a visual picture based on color. The darker areas are where there are higher rates of motorcycle related hospitalizations, lighter colors where there are lower rates. Um, we can also look at this if you want to look at health stats regions versus counties to kind of aggregate a little bit more. You can look at that because some counties have, you know, especially for things like motorcycles, um, have low enough rates that they are suppressed. Um, so that would be lower than 11 in this case. And for death data, that would be lower than three. Um, so right now, like you can look at HSR1 has a rate of 8.8, .8, but if we go to County of Residence, Sedgwick, Phillips, Washington, Yuma, we're not getting any estimates for those areas. Um, so when we look at these places, we can also kind of, uh, we can look at, you know, motorcycle accidents tend to be mostly males. Uh, they kind of peak at 25 through 34 years and at 45 through 54 years. I'm not going to say the words midlife crisis, but um, we can also look at a particular county. So if we want to look at, say, Clear Creek County and highlight that, we, you know, we can get these distributions uh, just for that county. Um, so a lot of this is suppressed, but we can see that it's all males in this case. If we look at a county like Denver, that has a higher population, we can look at uh, trends for just Denver. Again, mostly male, um, relatively similar age distribution. 
trends spike in 2021, like a lot of motor vehicle accidents. And we can also uh, select multiple counties. So if we want to look at like Denver and Adams, we can select those by hitting control click um, or I think Apple click if you're on an Apple. Um, if we want to highlight Boulder, we can do that. Just do some combinations uh, if you're looking at a particular area or series of counties that aren't necessarily correlated with the health statistics region. Um, so other than that, I would say, I would also like to you know, put in a plug um, for the State Demography Office uh, um, at the Department of Local Affairs. That's where we get our population estimates to calculate our rates. And um, if you want to get race and ethnicity data, I don't, you know, um, I don't want to say it's the most incredibly accurate. It's it's relatively accurate, but you know, again, take some of it with a grain of salt. Um, so if we want to look at motorcyclists, again, in our in our death data, we do have race from death certificates. So we can look at some race data. We don't currently have ethnicity in there, but we're working on it. We're also looking at adding a category that is um, delineating impairment with motor vehicle crashes and possibly TBI as well. Um, and I think that's basically the stroll I wanted to take you on. Uh, for this. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, Kenneth. I, I can't hear you, Kenneth. There we go. There you go. Um, so I was looking at this a while back and in the demographic data, um, I was just noticing that um, the, the breakout for Hispanics, because I know in the census data, that's like a separate question. And I was wondering if that was going to be incorporated because right now it's, you know, a portion of the population that is not kind of broken out um, because it is a, uh, if I remember correctly on the census data, it is a separate question. Um, under, I think it was under white and then whether or not it's Hispanic or uh, possibly under you know, all of them, in fact. Uh, yeah, um, you're absolutely right about that. And that it would be a separate question. So I think we would have, you know, something splitting out Hispanic and non-Hispanic. I don't know if we would get as complicated as to go into each race category and say, um, you know, black or African-American, Hispanic, non-Hispanic, um, you know, white, Hispanic, non-Hispanic. Yeah. Um, it was um, just an attempt to uh, pair up, you know, that demographic data with this data. And right. You know, one of yeah. the, the breaks that made it a little bit difficult to make that comparison. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's something we're definitely working on. Uh, we actually started working on it um, <laughs> and our injury epidemiologist left her position. Uh, so we're currently hiring our new injury epidemiologist and that's one of the first projects that's uh, gonna be on their plate. So, you know, stay tuned for exciting new updates. In okay. Appreciate it, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jenny. Thanks, Ian. Um, I had a question about um, the data sources. I know that you mentioned for the deaths, um, there's a vital stats program. Can you speak a little bit to what that program is? And I'm I'm curious to know if there's any um, uh, data comparison between the vital stats program um, for the deaths reported and then something like CDOT's data just to shore those up and make sure um, that the the reporting is the same. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, so um, the vital stats program does get data from death certificates. So that is, you know, they have 
Um, they receive data uh, in the form of those certificates and do kind of data entry into creating a database on those. And you can, um, they actually, I think, I can share out the website in the chat um, in a little bit, but yeah, death certificates is where that data comes from. Do they match up exactly with CDOT data and motor vehicle, uh, you know, is every death coded exactly properly in terms of what the manner of injury was? Like, maybe not. Uh, I'm, I haven't done a formal comparison, but, you know, just kind of thinking about it, um, I could see, for instance, uh, an injury being, you know, noted as, oh, head trauma was the cause of death, but that head trauma may have been due to a motor vehicle accident, but that wasn't coded as motor vehicle. It was just coded as head trauma. Um, but like I said, I'm not, I haven't done a formal comparison of that. I bet Dave Swinko, who has raised a hand, would probably know more about it than I would. Yeah, there might be some subtle differences, like uh, for traffic fatalities, uh, the death has to occur within 30 days of, of the event to be counted, but sometimes the death occurs after that. Uh, so there might be a difference there. Uh, the medical uh, aspect that that you mentioned, um, you know, whether it was a suicide or whether it occurred on a public roadway or a private area, though those might impact the differences there. So they, I mean, they should be close, but I, I wouldn't expect them to be exactly the, uh, the same. And then um, just my other kind of question on that, I think that that makes sense, but I wanted to make a, um, just understand this correctly with the CDOT data, um, that is all crash fatalities, uh, regardless of residency, correct? Residency. Yes. Like, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. And I, um, I know that one of. I, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna come back to Ian because I know he had mentioned that. Um, this is only for Colorado residents. And so it was kind of a follow-up question of um, why is that? Is there is there uh, reasoning why um, non-residents are not reported in this dashboard? Thank you. Well, uh, actually that is a question I can follow up on, but I don't know the answer to. This dashboard was put together by, you know, great and powerful epidemiologists that uh, came before my time at CDPHE. Um, so I can follow up on that and figure out why it is just Colorado residents. Um, my guess is that it has to do with the data being laid out by county and, you know, us not having a county of residents for those people who do not reside in Colorado. Um, that actually does bring me to another good uh, point about kind of the idiosyncrasies of this data. The, the county data that you see do reflect county of residence and not county of injury. So where these people live uh, is where the injury will be recorded, not where the injury actually happened. Um, I have a quick question, if I can jump in. Um, so I think this is a really great tool to maybe be a, kind of a starting off point about seeing what sort of injuries or, or deaths might be occurring, um, even with the limitations that you've described. Um, I think it's still useful. Is there, because I know some of our stakeholders have expressed um, an under underreporting of certain types of crashes. I know I've personally seen someone on a bike get hit by a car and then didn't seem too injured they both went their separate ways and that's one of the examples we hear about where maybe this person then does feel after the adrenaline wears off they report to a hospital or a emergency department um that, that doesn't 
no crash report is created. It doesn't go into the system. There's no record at the intersection now. Um, I don't think this can help solve that problem, but um, I think maybe this can be a good tool for some folks to be able to kind of identify maybe 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 some areas where that things like that might happen. If that if someone does find maybe their county or their um, whatever the the health statistics area is. Are they able to would they be able to reach out to you or someone else at CDPHE for more detailed information, or is is just kind of the, the rates um, the best you're able to give out potentially for like confidentiality reasons? Uh, it depends. I I encourage anyone to always reach out if they have a specific data question that they don't that they aren't getting a specific enough answer to from the dashboard. We are more than happy to do custom data requests. We can. You know, um, we can try to paint a general picture uh, with the data of what's going on, and we can get more detailed than what's in this dashboard. So I, I would say always reach out, um, and I'll put my email in the chat um, as we, you know, go on with the meeting. And there's also down at the bottom here, um, you can go to this little box, click to provide feedback or report an error. You can send a message through that as well. Like, hey, I have a question about this um, and I'll reply. Or when we have our injury epidemiologist hired, they will reply and uh, see what we can do for you. Okay, great. Uh, do any more questions for Ian? Okay, don't see any. All right, well, thanks, y'all. Great, thanks so much, Ian. Um, so now, um, so we're about a little over halfway, but we're, so we're right on schedule, I think. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, my colleague, Byron, and he is gonna give us some information on some of the current work that we've been doing here at Dr. Cog. Can't hear you, Byron. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Perfect, all right, well, let me share my screen then um, and I can get started here. And thank you for um, giving me the space to present here, Eric. Um, I am going to talk to you all a little bit about a couple things. So let me just start the slideshow. Um, on my end, I've got a couple things I want to screen share as well. So, <clears throat> all right, let's see. I just went black on my screen, so you're probably not seeing that either right now. Let's see if this comes back. Yeah, let's start the current slide. All right. Let's see if you're thinking about it. Okay, excellent. All right, well, my name is Byron Schult, and I'm a GIS specialist. I work with Jenny Wallace um, at Dr. Cog, and I work a lot with crash data. So I wanted to talk today a little bit about our data that we provide um, for 2021, our crash data. And then um, we just launched a crash data dashboard project. So I just also wanted to mention that and give a little bit of details about that. So uh, first off, we we heard from Alyssa and David about CDOT's data and how you can get that data. Um, Dr. Cog requests data through CDOT and then does some processing with it um, to make a data set for the region. So a lot of you are probably familiar with this already, but we do have uh, 2021 crash data is available. So this is just point locations for all crashes in the Dr. Cog region. And um, in this particular vintage of the crash data, there's about a little over half of the records are now filled out with th the 3447 form and 40% are still filled out with the old 2447. Um, we're expecting that to, to really tip to pretty much the major like 99% of them into 3447 next for the next year's data. Um, and with this as well, we've um, really sparked some more ongoing collaboration with CDOT with this data. So like Alyssa mentioned, um, there's been conversations about like what we're both seeing in the data and then sharing back and forth kind of some findings or some changes we've made or corrections to kind of help each other um, accelerate those data improvements. And that's been really exciting and really grateful for that, um, that time they're putting in. 
and then yeah, 2022 data processing is underway. We just um, will be requesting that shortly and pro processing that and sharing that out in the same ways. So you can look for that coming up as well. So the, the reasons you might want to use Dr. Cog data instead of other data sources you may have are these. So one, um, every record is ge geolocated to a point location that may or may not be unique from your other sources. But what may be is our QC efforts. We put a lot of time um, into quality control. So one of those is address cleaning. So the crash data comes in with um, the road names for the intersection potentially, and it doesn't have latitude and longitude because it's not on the CDOT system. So it really behooves us to clean those addresses really well. So we have the correct street names to place those points. Um, and so there's kind of a rigorous um, process to do that. Another piece is we do a manual check of high priority crash locations. So those include non-motorists, fatalities, serious injuries, um, and we're also going to include motorcycles in the future. And that's literally one of our um, team members goes and looks at every single point that is a high priority point and looks at the narrative, looks at the address, looks at everything to make sure that point is placed correctly as, as possible. And so that's potentially a, a big value um, for our data set. And then, yeah, we remove, remove duplicate records due to amendments. This is normally kind of cleaned up pre-distribution um, of the data, but um, we just make sure that there's nothing left there because sometimes if you amend a record, it, it doesn't remove the old one um, in the data that we receive in the format we receive it. We just need to add that step. Um, and then we also do some pre-packaged analysis, I guess you could say. We have Dr. Cobb calculated fields in our data um, for ease of reference. And I'll show you what I mean by that, but it just kind of means there's many related tables in the crash data in its raw format. And we're just taking um, information from the related tables and putting it all in a central location. And um, the data we provide, <coughs> the geo database that we provide on the regional data catalog has the, the different crash tables and the relationships between them built in. So if you want that level of detail, this could be a good data set as well. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So here's the Dr. Cog calculated fields. Um, this is just a screenshot, a little fuzzy maybe on your screen, but basically we take, as I said, the related information from those other tables. And instead of having, instead of you having to dig through those tables to find that information, we just compile the key pieces right in the crash main table. So for example, the Dr. Cog underscore NM field is number of non-motorists involved. And so just in this little snapshot, there's a record here where there was one non-motorist involved in a crash. So you can just quickly see that. Um, then there's Dr. Cog, T-O-T-L-K, um, total kills, so number of fatalities. So you can again see if there's that column, it's the um, third from the right. There's a record here where there was a fatality and you can see um, that that quickly as well. And it's flagged as a high priority in that far right column. And yeah, we also do this for serious injuries. Um, there aren't any in this in this sample that have that, but these fields just kind of allow you to go across and see quickly um, non-motorists, number killed, seriously injured, number of vehicles, number of occupants, just kind of some of those summary statistics to be quickly available to you. So there's a couple of places um, you can get the data. Uh, so one is the regional data catalog where you can get that geo database I was talking about as well as a data dictionary that explains all the field names and, and lays out all of that for you. And then we also have the data tool. Um, it's a web mapping interface um, where you can go and explore the data as well. Uh, it's The data is simplified there and it's kind of maybe more for quick and easy visualization and basic analysis. So I'll hop over to show you who this says. And yes, perfect. So the first thing I was gonna show is what you get if you download the crash data from the data catalog, you will need um, ArcGIS software to use the geo database. Um, we're also looking into providing the tables themselves, so you don't need this, but this is what it'll look like. So you'll add the crash 2021 points to a map. And here I'm just looking at Castle Pines. And you'll also have these related tables, um, the non-motorist vehicle occupant tables. And so if you click on a point, um, you can obviously get the information about the crash here. So the latitude, longitude, um, reporting unit, 
And then down here, those Dr. Cog calculated fields. Um, so here we had two occupants and two vehicles involved in this crash. But then you can also see the related information if you want more. Um, so you can see in the non-motors table, there's nothing, there were no non-motors involved, but in the vehicle table, you can take a look at the couple of vehicles and see um, about different contributing factors potentially. So that's one way you can get the data off the regional data catalog. <laughs> That's just hit this link. Let's see if this reloads. Um, but yeah, you'd go to the, you Google the regional data catalog and come here and the crash is 2021 um, data set. You would plug that into the search bar and then get data supplemental information and that'll download that geo database for you. And then here's the data tool. So um, this is just that web mapping um, interface where you can see on the right here, there's a lot of different layers, but one of them is the crashes layer. And so you choose to turn that on and visualize it. Um, and here red is a fatality. But what you can do here is not only see the different points and kind of you click on them and get some information about, um, you know, what, what kind of crash this was or what have, or what, who was involved, but you can also do some quick analysis. So if you were doing a project, on Hampton Avenue here, and let's say the limits go from uh, Yosemite Street over here to Dayton Street, you could drop a quick line, um, and you can change this buffer so it's a little bit narrower. And then you can get some, some statistics on the crashes that occur along that project route. So here's, here's the couple fatalities that have happened. There's one here, I think, and one at that intersection. How many serious injuries and how many non-serious injuries, non-fatality crashes. And you can also look at this broken down by the, the user type. So um, crashes with bikes or pedestrians involved. And this, if this takes a while, I can just tell you <laughs> the result was there was one um, bike involved crash at this intersection and one pedestrian involved crash at that intersection. But we've looked at a lot of dashboards today, so I'll, I'll, I won't make you sit through the rest of that loading. <clears throat> so, um, those are the ways you can access it. And those are kind of the, the things that differentiate the data um, and why you might find it useful. So I will stop there. I'm gonna talk about the dashboard project now, next, but I'll stop there and, and see if there are any questions first about the, the data. Great, doesn't look like there are questions right now. So I'll move on um, to the next piece. And feel free to ask um, at the end too. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is um, a project we just kicked off here at Dr. Cog to create a, a dashboard for crash data and to go beyond just providing the data um, that you need software to, to actually um, investigate and to, to go beyond kind of what the simple, simple functionality you have in the data tool is. But um, I want to talk about just essentially what, what we're thinking at this point. We just kicked this off a couple of weeks ago, so it's very preliminary, but I wanna go over just what we view as the high level goals of it, the timeline, and um, one dimension also, there's there's gonna be a future opportunity for, for this group and the consortium to provide input into what functionality you might like to see um, so that you can have a say in kind of how it's, how it's designed as well. So I'm gonna, be brief in this part. What is a dashboard? We've already seen a few <laughs> in uh, in this presentation today. So essentially though, right, it's just something that can include maps and data elements together um, that can both show the data, but provide insights at the same time. And it can also be interactive like we saw um, where you can set different filters and, and look at different subsets of the data or different geographic areas, for example. So we already saw the CDOT crash dashboard. So I'll skip that. This is just a quick example of what um, an explicit crash dashboard is, could look like. Um, this is a, another MPO, another Metropolitan Planning Organization, the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments. They created a, traf a, a traffic crash dashboard of their own, and it has the point locations of crashes on the map. So you can but it also has all these different filters, as you can see on the left, um, you could choose certain dates, you could choose a county, um, you could look at different levels of crash severity, and it'll filter down to just those points. So you can just really hone in on what, um, what the patterns may be in a certain area. So just to kind of give you a little bit more of an idea. 
So uh, at the moment, our project um, motivations, one of them is based on the needs assessment for the consortium um, that Eric's been working on. So the one that is identified as the geospatial three need, improve regional geospatial crash analysis. We want to respond to that. Um, and also the, the expressed desire from this group for more regional tools and prepackaged analysis. So it's, it's, it's kind of at your fingertips more rather than you needing to have the capacity and the software and all those things to delve in. The dashboard can be like more accessible to people to have a digestible and quick way of doing that. Also, of course, there's a growing safety crisis. So we want, we want tools that can help address that. Um, and at this moment, um, with all of the discussions we've been having lately and with the crash consortium, Dr. Cog capacity has grown um, to the point where we have more data expertise and more ability to do this kind of analysis and, and development. So we're excited to bring the benefits of that to um, the region. And so the objectives, again, just kind of providing more um, easier access into insights from the complex crash data provide um, a central location for regional crash statistics so that people can kind of rely on one source if they need quick stats on like the fatalities in their municipality or along a corridor. And um, of course we want to further the action for regional vision zero, um, our Dr. Cog program here. So anything we can do to keep up momentum on that is, is, would be great. And so the project timeline, um, Right now, we're, we're hoping to complete the, the dashboard by the summer. We just kicked off the project two weeks ago, so we're very preliminary, and there's a lot of details that will be filled in later. But we're working on defining the purpose and scope right now. Um, we're developing user stories, just kind of putting ourselves in the shoes of, of different users and what they want to see in the dashboard. We're going to look at peer dashboards to get examples of what we like um, and don't like in those. But then in the spring, we are planning to do some kind of engagement to get input from groups like this um, so that it's not just us imagining what is wanted, but we're actually hearing more specifics from um, stakeholders. And then we'll identify some key function functionality and begin development. And yes, wrapping everything up in uh, the summer to launch the dashboard um, and uh, yeah, provide that access to folks. So um, that's a pretty quick overview of that project. Are there any questions on that or the, um, the Dr. Cog crash data at this time? Hi, Byron. I do see a question from, um, from Jessica Jackson about is the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments dashboard live that you had referenced earlier? Yes. Yeah. And I can, I'll drop that in the link here as soon as I stop presenting. Um, so you can take a look at that. Yeah. You can play around and see exactly what the functionality is. Okay, and another question coming in, um, Josh, from Josh Sender in Adams County. When you say geocoded to a point, is that point always located on a road? It is not always located on a road at this time. We are working on that. Right now, there are points that have latitude and longitude that um, we just we just take from the raw data and place it. And if it's not high priority, we're not, we're not going to move that point. And sometimes they are maybe like 5, 10 feet off of the road line. Um, so no, at this time, not every point is, is exactly on the road network. Um, Sometimes that may be the truth, like the, the crash happened because someone went off road, but we are working on um, integrating our crash data into CDOT's LRS um, data set. So that will um, be snapping the points to actual intersections or onto a place on the road. Um, Kenneth? So when you say that um, you're taking the, the GIS coordinates from the raw data, um, are you are you betting that against like the description of the, the crash location um, or taking that as as read? Um, I've just sometimes seen where that latitude and longitude is the location of the officer, not necessarily the location of the crash. So just wondering if you're I can speak to that if you guys like. Yeah, um, in terms of the raw data. 
Um, so it really varies depending on the reporting agency. For example, uh, Denver PD, their GPS coordinates are given by dispatch. Uh, so if they say a crash happened at I-25 in Alameda, but the crash actually happened half a mile north, uh, they don't actually have the capacity to change the GPS coordinate. Um, so it is up to my team to hopefully catch it. Um, certainly for on-system crashes, we we do generally catch those and try to match them to uh, the mile point um, and certainly to the narrative. Uh, there are, uh, I'd say, about mm, 20 to 30% of crashes that are correct and simple enough that our system can figure it out. An example being two vehicles going northbound hit each other front to rear and the contact, like it, it can figure out that it's a rear end. Um, we don't necessarily uh, screen every single one of those, especially if they're off system in non-injury crashes, um, just because we don't have the capacity to do that. Um, in those cases, uh, we've had uh, officers uh, fill out a crash report at home, and so the GPS will be on a house or in the middle of a mountain or, uh, you know, the negative will be on the wrong value and it'll be, you know, in South America somewhere. Um, so there's definitely a variety in the GPS reporting, um, but between us and, and our partners at Dr. Cog and other um agencies, you know, we definitely do the best we can with what we're given. Yeah, I think, thanks, Alyssa. <coughs> and to kind of add to like what we do, Kenneth, um, given what we get from CDOT, all they've done already, <coughs> we do check, <coughs> sorry, we do check those high priority locations manually one by one. So if we see a a serious injury crash and our analyst goes and sees that the points in a parking lot, the, the officer may have filled out that form in the parking lot, but the narrative describes it as a, as an intersection a mile away, she will move that point to that intersection. So we don't do it for every single point. Um, there's going to be points out there that are not high priority in our definition that will, um, still have potentially that erroneous latitude and longitude, but for the high priority ones, we, we do as best we can to, to move those if there's still a need after we get it from CDOT. Okay. All right, good to know. Um, I guess rather sideline, just this was brought up uh, for the group at large. Sometimes it uh, it'd be really good to know those things that you see with the data in like the different jurisdictions and what, like uh, what Alyssa was saying with Denver, that being assigned by dispatch. Uh, for those of us using the data, like sometimes we have no idea what uh, what the little quirks are. Um, so if there's a way to communicate that um, in some capacity through this uh, project, that might be really useful in and of itself. Just knowing that, hey, here's what to look for. In the, when you're looking at a specific area, um, like in this case, you know, uh, knowing uh, whether or not it was vetted because it, you know, it's not a high priority location. You know, just knowing that, hey, if you're looking at a specific corridor, or whether or not it was in that high priority location, so we know um, if we're pulling that data that, yeah, we need to maybe, you know, review that GPS coordinate and location pair because, you know, it since it's not in a high priority location, it may not have been individually reviewed. But knowing that when reviewing that would be really useful, um, as well as maybe some of these other idiosyncrasies that you can really only know if you're directly involved with those agencies. Somehow, I, I don't have an answer to that part, though. Sorry. No, yeah, I can speak to that. Um, yeah, that's one thing that we've been trying to discern. Um, we've had a lot of really great conversations with law enforcement over the last um, course, of this, course of this project, and uh, especially since this fall. Um, I had the opportunity to present at the Colorado Association of Chiefs of Police back in November, and was there able to network with a few different um, departments at that, that meeting. Um, in the inventory, we do. I do have um, a chart that lists the different law enforcement agencies that we've learned, we've had communication with, and learned from in this process. And I try to list that out if whatever method that 
they're recording latitude and longitude, um, if they are recording latitude and longitude, and how they capture it. Um, and so that should be in, in the inventory for um, those, those agencies that we've had the opportunity to speak with. And as we go on, we hope to keep that in up to, up to date. And so if things change, if different agencies bring on different records management systems or use different um, computer aided, aided dispatches or different procedures, um, we're gonna we're trying to keep those up to date. And I will just add, sorry, my camera. Um, I'll just add from the Dr. Cog side. Um, when you download the uh, um, the data from our regional data catalog, it does come with data dictionaries, and we have a, a brief sort of crash data guide that mostly walks through um, those table joins. But something that we can take back and improve on is maybe a little bit more information about how we process the data and include that. So. Um, Kenneth, to your point, we can certainly do better in terms of communicating what those high priority records um, are and, and the process that we go through to, to QC them. So we'll take that back and, and work on it. Yeah, and we can certainly accommodate something like that as well. Um, maybe not to the point of the uh, maybe gently, like some of the idiosyncrasies with the different agencies. Um, it's been a lot of legwork to even diagnose them, and I'm hoping to fix most of them eventually. Um, so even keeping track of that process um, has been tricky for myself, but um, we can certainly, you know, discuss things like high priority crashes and things like that, because we certainly take that into account too. All right, it's great. Um, any last questions for Byron? Okay, cool. I'm not seeing any. All right, thank you so much, Byron. Really appreciate you going over all that. All right, we're almost done. We have 15 minutes left. I don't have too much more to go over, but a couple important things I want to touch on. Um, so let me just go ahead and share my screen again. Um, as I said, I did look at all of the comments that we received on the draft inventory and draft needs assessment, as well as the notes that uh, my colleagues took during the workshops. And based off of that, and just some more thinking and refining, I have gone through and done a few changes to those needs assessments. Um, first of all, I simplified uh, a number of them. I think we went down from about 24 three or 24 to 17. Um, and really just noticed some of them were pretty similar. Um, some of them kind of just sounded quite like one another um, and lumped some of those together into one need with a couple, couple call outs to the different sub components of those. Um, so two of the needs about different education were, they really seemed to be more of different strategies that apply to other needs. And so that was kind of a private, providing and coordinating training, um, improving standard and processes. They're not really they didn't really seem after some further review to be needs in and of themselves, but ways to further other ones. Um, one other need that we did add though, um, which in a way kind of furthers other needs, but seemed um, full enough on its own was one looking at emphasizing the um, increasing the number of completedness in the records. Um, so we felt that that was something that kind of stood on its own as something. With the comments received, we also re changed the priority of several needs. Um, we heard from some of the governments that the data integration, um, it was listed as a uh, low need, changed that to a medium priority. Um, and that's kind of agencies that are looking to try to bring in potentially toxicology information, um, information from law enforcement beyond the report um, or, through, or through the criminal justice process that can add more context to it. Um, there's a lot of some agencies that spend a great deal of effort on that, and so we wanted to call that out as something that is important. Um, this developing regional processing analysis or mapping, um, that was another, it was listed as low, but again, based on comments, we brought that up to a medium, and that's something we've kicked off here, and we'll be sharing out more information as we have it on how we can, how y'all can participate in that. And then finally, when I change um, this greater transparency in kind of sharing out information processes. I actually changed it from medium to low 
Um, not because it's not important, but because I actually think we're doing a really great job of that already as a group. Um, I know we have a lot of conversations here, Dr. Cog, um, with CDOT, with other um, stakeholders, and of course, they're here today um, talking with us. Last year, we had CDOT as well as representative from the Department of Revenue join us. And so again, I think we're already doing a really great job of that. We want to keep going with it, but I, I think that's, that's something we can actually um, look on and celebrate. I'm just gonna really briefly touch on these. Um, again, just combined a couple of things because some of them were pretty similar, increasing number of records with latitude longitude, increasing number of records in the CDOT with it. Different, but kind of similar, um, as well as in the geospatial realm here with the crash data, bringing these different different ways that can, inf can improve the regional data as one total goal instead of three separate. Looking at the data quality, there were a couple that, again, seems to, some that seem more of ways towards reaching that need. And so we've kind of brought that together under one heading. And again, and in the accessibility realm and integration realm, improving data sharing agency collaboration, um, as we talked about, that's kind of what we've been talking about as we were doing. And we're already doing well on that and bringing some of these factors together. So this is kind of the final list here. I'll just leave this on here for, for a minute. Um, there's another slide that has the rest of the list. We will be publishing this as the final form and distributing that hopefully in the next couple of weeks, as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting. Um, we're doing, we're very mindful of the accessibility needs of the documents that we're publishing. And so we wanna make sure that they're perfect and are good, good to go um, both together. Um, for just doing one document or the other. So those will be released as a pair in the next couple of weeks. But generally, the, the content hasn't changed dramatically. Um, just a lot of the, again, condensing some of these as well as um, doing some work on making the documents um, more accessible for all users. I'm saying that one sec. Um, some of these did stay the same, though. I just want to highlight a few. Um, Sorry, especially in the, are, oh, yes, Jenny. Sorry, really quickly. Um, are you needing oh. to share your screen? Yes, I am. I'm sorry. Oh, and I just see there was a message from Pete. I'm sorry, everybody. All right, so I'll just leave it here for another second. So since y'all can, so you can actually see it, I apologize again. Um, this is the first of eight, eight, eight of the needs here. Um, and also kind of readjusting, making a few changes to the unique, unique identifiers um, to make them a little more readable for everybody. Um, just like set the ID, the actual need itself and our priority level. as well as we have our the remainder of the ones that we've identified and kind of pared down from that longer list to this hopefully more manageable list for the group to work off of. OK. All right, and finally, I just want to conclude with um, going over some next steps um, and again, just detailing a few of the ongoing tasks and future things that we are working on here at Dr. Cog and as this group. Um, like I just said, we will be um, sending out those totally finalized and remediated um, inventory needs assessments um, within the next couple of weeks. Um, just want to highlight some of the work that um, is already going on in the region that we're a part of and that stakeholders are part of, including the Statewide Traffic Records Advisory Committee um, Crash Manual Task Force. Um, I know this has been a really, really, um, we've learned a lot through this process and been really happy to be able to contribute what we've heard from stakeholders to this group. Um, they're working to update the manual for reporting agencies so that even though the, the report can't be changed right in, in the short term, hopefully we can make it uh, the state's trying to make it easier to reference and make it more be able to make the reporting more consistent for um, law enforcement who are using that form. Um, we've been continu continuing to talk with 
um, stakeholders and reaching out to new ones. I mentioned the um, Colorado Association of Chiefs of Police. Um, that was a really great opportunity we had to, to network with the law enforcement community. And we also wanted to um, talk about how we just, just this is the ongoing conversations that are going on between us and among stakeholders. Um, if there's things that are different in your municipality or your agency um, that you that that has just changed, um, please let me know. Um, we're we're trying to keep the the inventory up to date um, as far as like maybe like I mentioned before with the records management systems or with the um, way that latitude longitude are collected. We're, we're trying to keep that up to date as well as what data sources um, agencies or municipalities are using. Uh, I know, for example, there were a couple of um, local governments who are um, who applied for 405C funding um, recently to get some of their rec their own records geocoded. And that's something that we we wanted we partnered with them just to talk talk through and understand, um, not in a way to oppose. We're not we weren't interested in doing that, but just wanting to make sure that we have this resource that's been created, it's been vetted with the stakeholder feedback. Um, if there are changes to data sources or procedures, um, just request that you please just let us know or talk to us about it first, just so we're all on the same page as we use this paperwork to go, these documents to work on these goals. Um, last thing I wanna mention on this is we have been working on building out the linear referencing system. Um, Byron mentioned it briefly in his presentation. Um, that's something that has been a part of our grant from the beginning, um, looking at um, integrating at least 25% of our records to a linear referencing system. And we're making really good progress on that, um, thanks to um, Byron and our other colleague, Josh. They've done a tremendous amount of work on um, with, with me and Jenny on getting this all together, but they've been doing a really amazing job. And so we're really appreciative for everything they've done there and think that can really help bring the level of analysis to a whole other level. And then as we just finally want to finish up on some of these next steps, um, on the, um, in the language of the grant, it really talks about um, developing outcomes, recommendations, and next steps to address the primary goal. And our primary goal is really to investigate and demonstrate the value of this group um, and work to solve, and as a region, work to solve common issues with crash data collection, processing, analysis. And so, in the needs assessment, um, if you've seen the if you've seen the draft versions, there are some potential strategies laid out, potential um, resources and organizations that could help affect those, and potential barriers we've identified. We are going to continue to work on refining those, developing more, um, more, more, more again, more of the strategies, resources, and barriers, as well as I'm trying to form. I'm working on forming some specific goals and targets based on these assessments. It's a little bit tricky, as some of the, the input, the, the data is not easily quantifiable. Um, as um, Alyssa and David were talking about not having a good way in, in, in the system currently to look back on what records have changed or what's changed between them. So getting a baseline on some of these is a little bit of a challenge, but it's something that I'm looking into currently. And we can um, I'll definitely bring that out. If anyone has ideas on, on these, um, please reach out to me. I just want to touch on, um, we're doing more research on the data collection, the methodologies, policy, and technology. I think our, we did a lot of law enforcement outreach. I think it's been really, really um, important and useful for us to understand how this is all coming together and working together as these different um, entities. As it's not just planners and engineers who are using this data. Um, there's fire departments, there's health agencies, there's um, planner, there's um, safety advocates. So we're all definitely in this together. So I'm glad to see so many folks represented today. And then lastly, on this page, working also to kind of brainstorm some different structure and meets different roles for this consortium. Um, I think we've learned a lot and it's been really useful and just trying to think of some ways that as, as we go forward over the next five, six months um, towards the end of the fiscal year, um, ways that we can really leverage the the collective strengths of the different organizations. I want to touch on just a couple of um, brief things that Dr. Cog has been doing in the realm of traffic safety traffic um, records. Um, Emily, are are you still uh, available today?
Yep, I'm here. Okay. Um, I just want to um, let my colleague Emily Kleinfelter speak for a minute um, as she is our um, regional safety vision zero planner um, to talk about those first two items. Yeah, thanks, um, Eric. Everybody here on the call, I have been working on um, for the last probably year more now, um, working with a lot of you on this call to update our taking action on regional vision zero action plan. Um, it's been a strategic update, so not really doing the entire document, but taking a closer look at that implementation plan, really the meat and potatoes of that plan that um, lays out for me and our partners, you know, the objectives and how and those actions in which we want to set out to achieve to get to our ultimate goal of, of zero. Um, that actually just the public comment period for that update just ended on Tuesday. Um, so we're in the process of doing some internal remediations, making sure it's update for all the accessibility guidelines that Eric spoke to. Um, and then we will be taking it to our different committees for approval in March and April, and then ultimately to our board for their approval um, in April as well. And uh, once we sort of have all of that, all of the, the I's dotted and T's crossed, we will be ready to hit the ground running on many of those key um, first year actions, first to one to two year actions. And um, I know that some of those are things that are related to vision zero, sorry, crash data and um, working with all of the partners that are on this call. So um, stay tuned. We will, we will definitely be reaching out for other ways to collaborate um, around safety. And then in that same vein, um, Byron and Jenny and our GIS team did really, really great work with me over the last year to um, develop the Regional Vision Zero Story Map, which is a complementary sort of resource to the Taking Action on Regional Vision Zero plan, where we took that crash profile analysis work that we did across the region, um, where we sort of divided up the region into the different area types, rural, suburban, uh, urban, and then limited access highways. And we developed those crash profiles based on the area types. Well, we took all of that really great work from the original plan and turned that into a much more useful tool in the, in the form of a story map. Um, and provided sort of proposed uh, countermeasures for those types of crashes. Um, and yeah, that's a sort of living resource that we will continue to update as the crash data becomes more um, current. And uh, you know, as this group addresses those challenges around crash data in the region, we hope to continue to update that uh, story map with more up-to-date profiles for crashes. And yeah. Uh, that's about it I've got. So thank you very much for having me speak today. And this was great. Great, thank you, Emily. And thanks for all the work you do on this. Um, the last two things to highlight here um, is just our the Dr. Cog, no, Dr. Cog board just did, did just approve um, the federal 2024 um, safety targets. Um, that's something that's information we found more on our website on the Transportation Advisory Committee. And um, our colleague, Aaron Billery, um, just completed our the active modes crash report um, back in the fall. And that's something that is another great resource for all sorts of these non-motorized um, vehicles and other forms of transport that looks at data from, I think, blue 2015 to 2019. And definitely something that we look, we're going to be looking forward to updating in the future with um, additional data. I know we're at time. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. There is one last thing, if, if anyone has a moment to spare. I do have, I did create a really brief Mentimeter. It's only one question. Um, is everyone able to see the screen? Use the QR code? No, I'm not seeing that. No, OK. All right. All right, um, is that working now for folks? Yes. Okay, yeah, so if you're able to enter, go to menti.com and enter this code or scan the QR code. Um, really just, an, is, I have an open-ended question for the group. I think we've had a lot of really great conversations and a lot of really great presentations from, again, CDOT, CDPHE, DOR, um, and uh, Dr. Cog staff and others, um, but, 
we want to make this sure the space is for everybody and that it's useful for for all. I think that I've learned a lot from all these presentations. And we want to make sure that it remains a useful tool for everybody. So as we go forward for the rest of the year and have another meeting or two, um, I'm going to go ahead and move towards, I think you can move to the next slide on your own. Or maybe I need to move us. But really just, yeah, what kind of content or um, other topics would you like to see at future future meetings? So maybe in a couple of months when we have another one. Um, and this also could apply to our newsletter. It, we've had some great guest articles, including one from Chief Newbanks of the city of Mead or town of Mead. So if there's things that you'd like us to address or you'd like to present on potentially or share an article, um, just go ahead and drop drop it into the the Mentimeter, and we will be able to, um, to to look into that. And of course, reach out to me if you have any questions, or or, or potentially want to be be able to share something like that. So a couple so far. One for um, LRS, the linear referencing system integration. Um, Vision Zero information, shared alternative transportation, other states or regions, discuss pooled funding for collective use of crash data analysis, presentations from jurisdictions showing how they use crash data, and enjoyed the updates, and that was informational. Okay, awesome. Connecting Otis, which is state data, to the 344 reporting and top items in crash form get cleaned. Okay. Okay, great. Now, this is really useful to, to me. And again, if you want to reach out to me specifically or, or directly, um, please feel free to do that. I'm going to go ahead and just conclude us. I know we're a bit over time. But again, thank you all so much for joining. Um, if you do have any questions or comments um, you want to share beyond what you posted in the chat or the Mentimeter, please just reach out to me directly. I'm always happy to see everybody here and see how much this, our, our region and state really cares about this issue. All right, thank you so much.